good morning. Uh, it is nine o'clock here in Finland and it's a beautiful snow, snowing, snowing weather here in Finland. <clears throat> Welcome to this Carbon Action Science webinar on soil carbon sequestration and water protection. <clears throat> My name is Laura Höyer and I work as a content director at the Baltic Sea Action Group. <clears throat> and Baltic Sea Action Group is leading the Carbon Action work. The webinar of today, it is organized, organized as a part of the so-called MULTA project. And this MULTA project is funded by the Strategic Research Council. And the project is part of the Carbon Action Platform. And thank you for the SEPBank. SEPBank is providing the facilities for the webinar today. And this is done uh, as part of the Baltic Sea cooperation between the Baltic Sea Action Group and the SEP. So about the program uh, today, we have the pro yeah the program today. The webinar is opened by the minister, and then we will hear new research topic, for example, on how to manage soils so that we have more carbon gain and that we lose less phosphorus. And let's keep this interactive. We have now about uh, 250 registered participants from different countries with di different backgrounds. So I'm really hoping to have very interactive uh, webinar. I will take questions after all the presentations, but we also have a uh, discussion at the end of the webinar. <clears throat> Before we start, some practical uh, information. And we will, uh, as this webinar is streamed, we will have the recording on the web page. We will also make a summary for you from this webinar. All this will be sent to you by email, but you can also find it from the web page. So please join the discussion. You can see the instructions here, and you have also got the instructions by email. As you like, you can add your name when you're asking questions. Uh, or if you like, you can leave your name out from, from this. Uh, and please be also active in social media. For example, if you use the Twitter, please tag Carbon Action. And of course, it, it, if you also tag those speakers who are active on Twitter. So we could start. We could start by practicing discussion. We could start by, if you could give a short answer to a question, what do you want to learn today? And please, if you can answer this question during the opening. Thank you, so let's start. I'm very pleased that the opening is given by the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Krista Mikkonen, please. Thank you, dear friends of healthy land and soil. We cannot separate our actions to safeguard the growing conditions in fields from those that safeguard the status of waters. Our common goal should be both healthy fields and healthy water bodies. Nutrients need to be captured and recycled efficiently so that, so that we can reuse them as energy where they are needed rather than releasing them where they are not needed, such as in the water bodies. The Baltic Sea will greatly benefit if we can embrace this change of mindset. And this is which, which the BCA, BCA key promotes through its own activities. At the same time, we must recognize that domestic food production and food security cannot be taken as granted. Continuing changes in agricultural practices and climate change are posing challenges to our domestic food production which is why I wish to highlight the importance of today's team. Although this winter has been especially cold, the previous one showed record warm temperatures and a record high in the nutrient load in the archipelago sea, for example. At the same time, the recovery of our, our waters is slowed down because of the warming of the water and the deoxygenation of the sediment bottoms. Climate change is already visible in the, set, in the state of our waters. In his blog, Antti Iho, a senior scientist of the Natural Resource Institute Finland, 
wrote about the nutrient load in the Baltic Sea. He pictured the stock of the eutrophic reserve of the sea as a 200 liter tub. The daily new load of the phosphorus that is discharged in the sea would be less than two tablespoons. The annual load would be a 10 liter bucket and in 20 years, it would be 200 liters. But the load already fills the whole tube. So what do we need to do to keep the load below the rim of the tube? How much phosphorus reduction do we need? The river basin management plans in force in Finland until 2021 estimated that a good ecological status of coastal waters would require a reduction of the annual phosphorus load by 440 tons and the nitro nitrogen load by 6,600 tons. Our current proposals for river basin and marine management plans for 2022 to 27 have been set up to achieve a good ecological status. These plans also contain a large number of measures to decrease diffuse pollution and to promote carbon sequestration. In agriculture, the main measures proposed are those affecting runoff and soil condition, such as winter vegetation cover, crop rotation, nutrient fibers, and structural lime and gypsum treatment of fields. Along with these measures, we need to expand the range of water management tools and renew our thinking from local scale management to catchment-based water management. We especially need catchment-based solutions to improve water management in agriculture and forestry. In practice, the opportunities for catchment level surveys are constantly improving. By developing special data sets and design tools, we will be able to carry out holistic assessments at the catchment scale. We also boost our knowledge base of nature-based water management solutions. Finland's government provides significant support for water protection. With the water protection program from 2019 to 23, we will be able to accelerate our protection of water bodies and marine areas. Dear friends, last year, gypsum treatment was applied to nearly 9,000 hectares of arable land to improve the state of the archipelago sea. We also saw great progress in experiments on applying other new agricultural water protecting measures, such as nutrient lime and nutrient fiber in the regions of Uusima and Southwest Finland. For the gypsum treatment for farmers, authorities, agricultural advisors, gypsum suppliers and distributors in the region of Southwest Finland all worked together. Through this new type of collaboration, we were able to collect valuable information on the effects of gypsum treatment and farmers' experiences. This spring, farmers will be able to apply gypsum again. The goal this year is to read gypsum to 20,000 hectares in the archipelago sea catchment area. At the same time, structure, structural lime and nutrient fiber pilots are providing new information on the potential use and effects of substances in reducing the nutrient load of agriculture on water. This year, the projects will provide a guidance document for farmers on the use of the methods, which we hope will contribute to the wider adaption of the methods. You'll hear a presentation on another project 
related to this ledger. In the autumn of 2020, the first state grant application for agricultural and forestry water management projects was implemented in cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. As a result, nearly 20 new water management projects will now be funded in March and April. The grants are intended to accelerate local experiments and regional cooperation projects that support the sustainable water management of fields and forests, promote water management at river basin level, and reduce pressures on water bodies. Government funding for water production in agriculture is currently on a good level, but we need to secure funding for the widespread use of mitigation measures in the future. One of the best tools for this is the Common Agriculture Policy Program. Today, we are also talking about the new water program of the Central Union, Union of Agricultural Producers and Forest Owners. This water program is a great demonstra demonstration of the industry's responsibility on water protection issues. The, pro the program states that water protection is an integral part of responsibility and sustainable Finnish agriculture and forestry. This is well said. Other innovative approaches are also needed. Your Carbon Action Platform, a network of over 100 farms taking part in pilots for carbon farming is also a great achievement. We need to manage soils to increase carbon sequestration and to reduce phosphorus losses. To do this simultaneously, we have to understand the key mechanisms and processes of both biogeochemical cycles. Synergies can be found if carbon sequestration can maintain a negative phosphorus balance and if phosphorus can be stored in higher amounts of organic matter. Dear friends, in this webinar, we look forward to hearing more about these synergies from the scientific experts. And let's continue to work together. Thank you all for your dedicated work in building a common future for food production and water protection. Thank you. Very good and clear opening. My background is actually at the Ministry of the Environment, and I'm very pleased to see now how much of the Ministry of the Environment is putting support on this very important topic. So thank you for this. At the moment, we do not have any questions for the Minister, but there are some answers to the question I posed at the beginning. And I think now the audience is what are they hoping from this webinar, what they want to learn. They are interested to hear more about the research results on carbon sequestration on water projection. So it's a good now to start with the scientific presentations. And first uh, we have research professor Jari Liski from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. He coordinates the research done at the Carbon Action Platform. And today he will tell us about the multidisciplinary work research done on the carbon action. Please Jari. Thank you, Laura. Just want to confirm that you hear my voice OK, Laura? Yes, perfect. Thank you, yeah. Yari. And you can also see my slide. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you very much. OK, well, dear minister, dear other uh, webinar participants, uh, I work as a research professor at the uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute and I'm also the head of climate system research there. And I'm the coordinator of this carbon action research part. Uh, now, in the following 10 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of research carried out in the Carbon Action platform. So, in Carbon Action, we are developing uh, science-based solutions of regenerative uh, farming. So, and we're developing solutions that would be applicable in practice at a large scale and internationally. Our idea is that we are kind of uh, using uh, 
Finland as a as a test laboratory and where to pilot the, these uh, solutions that we are developing. And maybe the uh, four keywords in the middle of the slide tell the environmental aims of the solutions that we are developing. So we are uh, developing solutions that are would help to uh, mitigate climate change and adapt to it, uh, promote soil health, uh, where we are concerned and developing solutions to, to uh, improve the condition of water bodies. Here, importantly, the Baltic Sea and also enhancing and supporting uh, biodiversity. And uh, carbon action is collaboration between scientific research, farmers and businesses. And together we develop, test and put into practices uh, regenerative uh, agriculture. And here I'm now telling about our multidisciplinary research part of this collaboration. So the research we have in carbon action can be divided into uh, four levels. In the center, at the most detailed scale, I was also maybe of mo most fundamental scale, we are studying processes that enhance sequestration of carbon into soil and stability of the sequestered carbon in the soil. At the second scale, uh, when we have learned that which are the processes that we would need to support in the, in the soil, we are studying that the, how the favorable processes of carbon sequestration and the long evity of carbon in the soil can be supported by different uh, farming practices. Then at the third scale, we're studying how the beneficial uh, farming practices and processes could be adopted in the everyday work of ordinary farms. And here, the, uh, with also the Minister of Environment uh, mentioned these uh, 100 uh, pilot farmers are a very relevant kind of a research material or collaborators of our research at the third scale. And then finally, at the fourth scale, uh, we are studying how the benefits of regenerative farming can be used in various ways in the society. So this is kind of the overall uh, outline of the carbon action research. Uh, we carry out experiments on our study fields in different parts of Finland. Here is a photo of our uh, biodiversity soil carbon experiment, which has been established uh, on the fields of University of Helsinki here, uh, here in Helsinki Viikki campus. Uh, in addition to these experiments, mathematical modeling plays an important role in our research. And we also uh, making use of advanced methods of computational ecology in our work. Uh, in addition to these uh, intensive study sites that we have, we have uh, more than 100 farmers across Finland who have established a carbon farming experiment on their farm, on their fields, where they have delineated a 1.5 hectares of uh, area for carbon farming practice and used a similar area for a business as usual practice for comparison. And now we are estimating the carbon budget and also other impacts of this uh, carbon farming practice uh, using sampling and also uh, using the calculation methods that we are developing as a part of this carbon action research. And this is a photo of this kind of experiment on one farm. The carbon farming site is kept green, is, is kept green even late in the autumn while the soil on the control side is prepared as the business as usual for comparison. An important part of our research is the uh, development of a verification system of carbon sequestration and the impacts of regenerative farming. This is very essential because it's uh, not possible to uh, develop any kind of incentives and those kind of um, uh, to, to control and to, to, uh, to regulate the, this uh, uh, regenerative farming and without if we do not know the impacts on carbon sequestration and if we do not know the impacts on the other functions of this forest. So that is why it's, uh, it's absolutely crucial to develop a verification system to, to quantify these uh, variables. Uh, 
and the, our idea is that we are developing a, a methodology that would be applicable on ordinary farms without any specific uh, instrumentation or any specific samples. We, we may need to take some uh, uh, measurements, but still the idea is that we would develop this, uh, this uh, verification system on and test it at our study sites and by doing that to ensure that it calculates reliable estimates also for ordinary farms. So, and the idea here is also that we are developing the natural science uh, kind of a system that would be uh, represent the state of the art with science and then from the natural science based estimates we then derive estimates for various uses in the society. For example, here mentioned the greenhouse gas inventories of countries or regions or maybe companies maybe, and then uh, estimates which, which uh, uh, are according to the rules applied and developing carbon markets and also uh, according to the rules that are used for cal calculating carbon footprint estimates of products and, and services. And the system, like all the, all the research work that we do in Carbon Action, we're developing this system to be applicable uh, internationally. And to illustrate this verification system and the functioning of our uh, the fields, which are part of our Carbon Action studies, we have created a open, free web-based uh, service, what is called a field observatory. It is there in the ad address fieldobservatory.org uh, for anybody interested to take, take a look at. So the idea of this field uh, observatory is that it collects and presents real-time data from our study sites and we have also included 20 of those carbon action farms in to this uh, field observatory at this point. And soon we will be adding our first 15 day forecast of carbon sequestration and at one of our intensive study sites. The idea of carbon action research is that we would uh, like we have collected the uh, several universities and, and several research institutes to, to take part in this work, to carry out this work. And we have also uh, uh, want our work naturally to be very strongly networked internationally with, with the best partners. So here are some of the uh, logos of those contributing to and carrying out the research in this carbon action. We are doing this research in uh, in uh, by, by project money and uh, at the moment there are uh, is it that uh, it that's it even more than 15 uh, individual projects ongoing at the moment on this carbon action uh, platform and then uh, we have many projects and they have they're, they are funded by uh, different organizations and we, we certainly uh, acknowledge the contribution of this funding because they're the only ones who make make this possible and with this, I'll finish this presentation about the overview of carbon action research. Thank you, Yari, for the very clear presentation. And yes, indeed, I calculated there are 17 projects on the carbon action platform. And it's very good, Yari, that you showed the, the projects, because actually today we are going to hear about the Mulda projects, but then we are going to hear about the Halves Manual project that was also on the project platform. So later today we will hear about that, that project. And yes, we do have questions. And please, I remind, please ask questions from, from our, our speakers. So we have an interactive webinar. But there is a question. I think a question we all are looking for is the verification system. And will it be ready for use, your verification system? Laura, was it like when it will be ready? Uh, no, actually, I can't. Uh, yeah, I think ready for use. OK. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, so the and then actually now, now it was somebody added or about the carbon calculator. Could you add like phosphorus or biodiversity? Could you show the multidisciplinary sort of multi benefits on that calculator someday in the future? Uh, well, yeah, well, to, to the last question, definitely <laughs> yes, because I mean, the uh, like I tried to uh, say is that we, we really need to uh, 
be able to quantify the carbon sequestration, but also the other impacts mm. of the regenerative mm. farming, because otherwise we cannot, you know, it, it needs to be sustainable in every respect. So that, mm. is, that is definitely in line with the kind of framework that we have developed. And definitely we are already adding the biodiversity aspects there and mm. the uh, yeah phosphorus we have to work a little bit more on. And then about the kind of a level of readiness of our verification system is that the our philosophy has been that the uh, we are developing, we not, do not make any compromise with developing developing the kind of science core of our calculator because this carbon and all the other impacts of regenerative farming, they will be so important in the future that I, I don't I cannot think that anything less than <laughs> except the highest level of science can be enough. And then at the same time, we acknowledge that there is a, there's a very high demand for this information in the society. So that is why we are actually literally practically working to make an operational versions for different uses mm. from this from this uh, this calculator. But when we have the, the always up to date uh, science base for this, we can always compare the more simple calculator estimates for this for this uh, uh, like the the most fundamental one, and so that and so that we are developing in parallel the science base and the operational version. That was an excellent question and complemented very nicely what I tried to say. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Yari. I'm very happy to hear that we are looking, we are aiming for the best uh, possible scientific quality here. This is important message. Thank you, Yari. I think we can now move on. And actually, in our studio, we have the next speaker here. So we are going to have uh, the senior research scientist Thomas Mattila from the Finnish Environment Institute. And he's going to tell us how to manage soils for increased carbon sequestration and reduce phosphorus losses. What well, are the mechanisms and processes? Thank you, Thomas. And to keep it safe, I think I just <laughs> move away from here. So you have room. Okay. <clears throat> Hi everybody, nice to be here and talk about an important topic after two important presentations. Could I have the uh, presentation visible? Thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a need to increase carbon sequestration in soil and there's a need to manage soils for less phosphorus loss. Now I see concerned faces in the studio. Does the audio work? Audio works, great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the work I'm presenting now is actually not yet published or not even yet peer reviewed because of time schedule problems. It's based on a manuscript. We are writing with colleagues who uh, whose names you can see there. So it's non peer reviewed but based on peer-reviewed science. It's more like a perspective of what could be done. And in Multa, we are now testing the bits as we go. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to start with two round shapes. Uh, I would guess that to the audience, either one of these is very familiar or both of them are very familiar. On the left, you see uh, the planetary boundaries which describe the ecological boundaries and the amount of environmental load that humanity is currently putting to those boundaries. And you can see that the ones which are most, have the most exceedance are the biogeochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen, the biodiversity aspects, and then also climate change and land system change. And surprise, surprise, all of these are connected to soils through another round shape, which you can see on the right, which is soil functions, which is a <clears throat> neat way of describing what soils do functionally. And they have a lot of functions which have been identified for a long time. But the three main functions I'm going to focus today are carbon sequestration, water purification and nutrient cycling. And I think it's a kind of a nice idea that if our soils would function really well, that would uh, answer the most critical uh, problems we are facing ecologically. Next slide, please. <clears throat> then I wanted to show some more round shapes, which are much less abstract and might not be as familiar to many of you and might be really familiar to the farmers out there. Those are soil aggregates. They make up soil. And on the left side, you see a very highly uh, resistant aggregate, which is highly resistant to dispersion in water. And on the right side, you see another aggregate, 
which is highly non-resistant to dispersion in water. And there you see a simple laboratory test of putting aggregates into water and seeing what happens. And on the right side, all of those aggregates dispersed pretty <clears throat> seriously. Of course, you can imagine what this does to phosphorus emission risks on these different soils. So actually, we don't have abstract soils with functions. <clears throat> we also have small soil particles with properties like aggregate stability. And now if we would like to move from the right to the left, like increasing aggregate stability, we would need to add something there. Could you put the next slide, please? <clears throat> and the question is, what's gluing those sand particles together? It's carbon. And therefore, the topic is carbon farming and what that can do to enhance also uh, phosphorus mitigation. So if carbon farming isn't a familiar topic, I guess it is for many. It's been a hot research topic for quite some time now. And <clears throat> some of those reviews highlight uh, the most common methods used to sequester carbon in the soil. So it's better crop rotations, more cover crops, perennial grasses and legumes in the crop rotation, adding manure, adding compost, no tillage, conservation tillage, rewetting uh, organic soils and improved grazing land management. Agroforestry could be added there, but it wasn't there. But the big picture there is that they either function in one of two ways. Either or they can have both. OK, <laughs> they can have both. Uh, but they mainly function by increasing carbon inputs to the soil. So cover crops, when they are grown, they catch sunlight, convert it into plant biomass, and when the cover crops die, they deposit carbon to the soil surface, which get decomposed and uh, stabilized into the soil matrix. Or they can function as reducing carbon losses. For example, when you convert a soil to a perennial grass, decomposition slows, uh, and there's less tillage, less oxygen, more suitable conditions for carbon storage. So two big levers there. Either you increase the carbon inputs or then you reduce the carbon losses. But that's the big picture. The a bit more detailed picture is on the next slide, <clears throat> which tries to describe our current understanding of what's going on. It's, this is the SOMIC model, which was a bit uh, modified for this purpose to increase the phosphorus cycle also. But the idea is that the carbon which comes from plant residues is decomposed by microbes into dissolved organic carbon, which is at the center. Then that dissolved organic carbon is either used up to build new microbes, or then it gets uh, stabilized onto mineral surfaces, and these are at equilibrium with the dissolved organic carbon. So the important thing about uh, soil carbon sequestration is to realize that we have different forms of carbon currently in the soil and they interact. We have minerally stabilized uh, carbon, we have dissolved carbon, we have microbe carbon, and then we have plant residues in various stages of decomposition. And the whole thing is run by plant growth, which provides the carbon input into the system. Okay, <clears throat> but Here's where it gets a bit more messy. It's when we realize that this carbon cycle is actually connected to the phosphorus cycle also. So as the microbes uh, dissolve land residues and produce dissolved organic carbon, they also produce dissolved organic phosphorus, which then gets converted into dissolved inorganic phosphorus, which is at equilibrium with the mineral surfaces which are at equilibrium with the dissolved organic carbon. So there's an interaction between these two cycles, and they are both managed by managing plant growth through fertilization, which also controls the phosphorus balance between what gets into the soil through fertilization and what gets out of the soil through offtake. Simple, right? Let's go into a bit more detail and realize that soils as abstract things don't exist. There are specific soils in specific places with specific 
hydrologies. So phosphorus doesn't magically jump out of the field. It's always carried either by particles or by water. So soil structure and hydrology are key elements in influencing this uh, phosphorus loss from the soil and also carbon sequestration. So on the left side, you see a uh, kind of a caricature of a field with poor structure and poor vegetation cover. So you get the same amount of rainfall on both sides, the good structure and the bad structure. But uh, on the poor structure side, a lot of the rainfall will get out as surface runoff and the potential for carrying uh, particles with phosphorus is very high. If the structure is good, then a lot of that water will be, first of all, captured by the vegetation there. Then it will get infiltrated, slowly percolated down, and a lot of that will be used by the plants later on for growth and will leave by evapotranspiration back out. And runoff through drainage and surface runoff is less. So in addition to that biogeochemical cycle, we have the water cycle, which forms the carrier for the phosphorus. And of course, to all those farmers and people who work with farmers, realize that actually the soil structure and water balance is what a lot about what farming is about. We try to capture rainfall and convert that into evapotranspiration. So there's a potential for a win-win-win in this case, if you want to use that term, that the more rainfall we can catch and store and convert into evapotranspiration, the more potential we have for carbon sequestration and the less potential we have for water leaving the field carrying phosphorus with it. OK, next slide. Because <clears throat> we probably all realize that, that carbon sequestration is a slow process. Because if we can add a few tons of carbon per year, per hectare, and the, so, whole, the whole bathtub of carbon is something like 200 tons of carbon per hectare, maybe 100, maybe 60, but a lot bigger than what we can add annually. The same thing applies also to phosphorus in a lot of soils. So a concept of legacy phosphorus is important in this stage. Uh, legacy phosphorus means all the phosphorus that was applied historically, but was not removed by the plants and has accumulated there. And a good distinction is there that it's now exceeding a certain threshold, which is useful for plants. So we have in many soils, we have accumulated more phosphorus into the soil than it, what is needed by the plants and also what is uh, critical for water quality. And here you can see in this chart <coughs> uh, that as you move to the left, the excess phosphorus amount increases in the soil. It's, it goes up to 400 milligrams per kilogram, which is about 800 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. And as it does that, the amount of DRP, dissolved reactive phosphorus, which we don't want to see leaving the field, that's algal food, goes up. And as that uh, critical excess phosphorus goes to zero, then also the dissolved reactive phosphorus goes to zero. But to get that to zero would mean that we would have to take 800 kilograms of phosphorus out of the system through plants, preferably by getting the plants to uptake them and convert that to yield, which gets exported. And on several research studies, it's been shown that it takes about 50 to 20 years of highly negative P balances to uh, kind of fix a soil which has a lot of phosphorus accumulated. But the point here also is that not all soils are loaded with phosphorus. So on that chart there, there's a huge range. It goes from zero to 800 kilograms. We tested our carbon action uh, intensive study sites and they go from zero to 600 kilograms excess phosphorus. So we have to be site specific. We have to find out which fields have huge reserves of legacy phosphorus and what, what can we do to get the yields up and get the phosphorus mined out before it gets to the water bodies. So here's one, one big synergy 
which can go right. But of course, not all people are optimists. Some people like to look at what can go also wrong. So the next slide should show what can go wrong with carbon farming and phosphorus. So, so four SEs. There, the first thing is solubilization. So as we increase carbon inputs, microbe activity, root activity in the soil and add cover crops. What happens is that this legacy phosphorus, which is in the soil, gets converted into highly reactive plant available forms, which can be a good thing. But if we don't realize and control this aspect, we are kind of enhancing the transfer of legacy phosphorus into the nearest water body. Then we have a problem of stratification, which means that if we initially have uh, phosphorus well mixed in the whole uh, soil profile, once we reduce tillage and start adding roots, which mine the soil profile, catch all that uh, phosphorus and concentrate it into the plant bodies, it gets concentrated both to the soil surface and then into the root channels all over the place. And this creates a high local pea saturation. So there can be a large amount of uh, mineral surfaces that could absorb uh, phosphorus in the soil. But if we concentrate the phosphorus into a few percentage of the whole soil profile, that local saturation can be so high that we generate dissolved reactive phosphorus. Third S is sorption, which is, this is neat, uh, because as you saw in the, in the earlier chart, carbon competes with the mineral surfaces and, and with iron uh, competes with phosphorus uh, about the iron and aluminium so surfaces. So once we add a lot of carbon, what happens is that some of that carbon will dissolve phosphorus. Also, some of that carbon will chelate iron and then allow more phosphorus to be released. So as we move to carbon farming, we will inevitably increase the availability of that phosphorus. And if there's a huge pool of phosphorus in the soil, this is a risk. And this is uh, partially behind those problems that have been seen in Lake Erie in scientific literature, that when conservation agriculture increased, that started solubilizing the accumulated phosphorus in the watershed, which created problems which had to be solved somehow. And the fourth S is a bit like a bad S there. It's just a reminder that once we add soil carbon, organic matter isn't just carbon. It's carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur, among other things. And if we add 100 tons of carbon into the soil, that will inclu include about two tons or 2000 kilograms of phosphorus, which is a lot. So we have to figure out smart ways to get that phosphorus stored into organic matter without bringing it from the outside and without messing the carbon balance and without solubilizing the legacy phosphorus. How to do that? What can go right? So one slide back, please. <clears throat> so what could possibly go right with carbon farming and phosphorus? So a lot of R's if, if the previous was a lot of S's. So first of all is with soil cover, we have less erosion and we have more aggregate stability. With living roots, we get more evapotranspiration. That means less water being able to carry phosphorus. Phosphorus doesn't evaporate. Then we have deeper roots, which ideally results in better hydrology so that we don't have a preferential flow, which means that water will find the nearest crack and go straight to the drainage, but it will infiltrate and percolate gradually through those root channels and kind of have time to interact with the whole soil profile. But that requires care. If we work with a compacted soil, which has single root channels, that's not better hydrology in a sense. Then cover crops will supply more phosphorus to the crops, which means potential for less fertilizer with the same yields and a potential for negative uh, phosphorus balance. And also higher yields, which are kind of behind getting higher evapotranspiration and, and fixing soil structure, uh, allow a negative P balance. So it's actually really difficult 
to mine that phosphorus out of the soil rapidly unless you have cover crops and you have high yields. So there's a there's strong synergy there. There's also a recognized risk for things going wrong. And how do we put this together? The answer to that is, first of all, to look at the landscape level. Here's the chart looking at phosphorus risks based on, on a GIS a wider map and then phosphorus concentrations done by Chagask in Ireland. And this is a series of studies which have highlighted that actually at the landscape level, it's, it's not all the hectares that are causing the phosphorus risk. It's actually less than 10 percent. Sometimes it's, it's a lot less than 10 percent of the whole land area which are causing most of the risks. So we should find tools to identify these hotspots where they are, and then we should target these hotspots for hydrological intervention so that the water cannot go through. It has to slow down and sink gradually through, and we would have to find out ways to get that extra phosphorus out of those flow paths which carry that potentially to the water body. Of course, these are also good uh, spots for designing something like agroforestry systems, which would control erosion and control hydrology there. It wouldn't have to be the whole landscape, but targeted solutions or maybe 5% of the landscape could target a lot of the phosphorus runoff. What to do with the whole landscape then? Then we have to integrate a bit. So that's the whole idea of the MULT project anyway. We have to look at multiple benefits and, and kind of look at it from a broader scope than just carbon or just phosphorus. But from a phosphorus viewpoint, we're used to looking at, at carbon balances in a simplified way, like increased carbon inputs, reduced carbon losses. But if we start looking at what do these cover crops do, they also increase evapotranspiration, they stabilize temperatures, they increase infiltration, they increase aggregate stabilities, they increase earthworms, and they increase phosphorus availability. So these tools that we have for carbon farming, they also uh, have multiple functions. And if we are not aware of those multiple functions, it's likely that we will cause unintended consequences. I think the next slide is just the ending. No, sorry, <laughs> one more slide at least. Uh, I wanted to show the range here of absurd values related to what's happening in the carbon action fields. We have all the data in, in Zenodo. It will get updated there annually with our monitoring. But in 2019 monitoring sets, uh, the variation in infiltration rates on the left, that was staggering. There, there was like almost no infiltration to more than 60 millimeters of infiltration per hour. So you can imagine what happens when you have a rain of, of 30 millimeters per hour hitting that uh, series of fields. If we could improve that infiltration by soil structure and, and porosity, we could absorb a lot of rainfall when it comes. And on the right side, you see the water holding capacity, which also varies a lot. So the, the kind of we could manage these soils to catch and store a lot of water. That's the point. And that stored water is then a resource for evapotranspiration, which then increases carbon inputs through plants. That's the idea. And at the same time, all the water that gets stored and used for evapotranspiration isn't carrying phosphorus out. Yeah. So we are doing this monitoring on, on carbon action. We have these uh, pilot farms, then we have intensive study sites, we measure stuff annually, we measure stuff every half an hour with sensors and everything gets into the field observatory. So uh, it's kind of a learning diary, the field observatory. We will see what we learn when we monitor a lot of fields. And then this is the final slide. So you'll find more info at the field observatory. You will get I think the next last year's monitoring results will be maybe next week on, on Zenodo and this will get updated. And before you shoot questions at me, I'll shoot two questions at you. So the last slide, please. So two questions to think about. 
in your region, do you know where the P hotspots are? And how could you find out? And do people use cover crops in your region and has that influenced fertilizer rates? I think these two questions will help a lot in mitigating phosphorus and increasing carbon at the same time. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Thomas, for the very, very clear presentation. And I'm very happy we have quite a many questions for you here. And, and just to remind, there is a separate link uh, so that you can join the discussion and ask questions. So we have first question from Austria. Uh, no tillage is mentioned. As far as I know, there is no evidence that no tillage helps to capture carbon, but it helps for erosion. What is your point of view? Uh, yeah, the, the, the big studies on no tillage is that it doesn't increase carbon sequestration unless it results in higher yields. So, so there are some regions in the world where it can increase carbon sequestration, but for example in Finland, uh, maybe not unless like more research is needed. But, mm. but the, same, the summary is that no till is uh, not as effective as initially thought. But like we now talk about carbon farming and regenerative agriculture mm. and we talk about minimum tillage. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and of course it's good to so, sort of... Yeah, so, so if, if you combine no-till mm. cover crops mm. and crop rotation, mm. then you have a good system like con conservation yeah. agriculture and that sequesters carbon. Yeah, that, that's good to remember, yes. And then about microbial necromas. Could you comment on the, on the importance of microbial necromas as stable soil organic matter? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a soil microbiologist, but, but what I've read and, 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 and the big change there is that, that most of the carbon in the soil isn't actually directly plant derived. Mm. It, it has gone through the microbes. So if, if you remove the chart there, it has gone from the plants to dissolved organic carbon to microbes and then stabilized into minerals. So. Yeah, so the, 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 the pro, we just can't kind of have dead plant matter accumulating in the soil that will create a peat, but, but we have to get it microbially decomposed and then stored inside uh, soil in our yes. surface. Well, yeah, I'm a soil microbiologist, Good. but it's about 20 years that I did research last time, but I think some people talk about like zombies, they are like sort of dead microbes that yeah. store the carbon, so you can sort of imagine. Yeah, I, I like to call them micro mummies. Uh, they mummies, kind of, that's good. They get, yeah, yeah, maybe even better. And yeah, yeah, go that's inside good. And that's good. That makes you don't sense. want to disturb those micro no, no. mummies. They get angry. Yeah. Yes, and then you are you are measuring uh, DRP leakage, dissolved mm. phosphorus leakage of different carbon farming practices in your observation sites, and how or are you measuring? And when will there be data on these measurements? Good point. We are not measuring DRP leakage. What we are measuring is uh, water soluble carbon at the soil. Because the, how to say, the carbon action experiment wasn't designed as a leach field. So, so these three hectare areas don't have separate drainage. We, we cannot measure the outfall of water and measure the water quality. But what we can measure is we can measure uh, the hydrology at the site, like evapotranspiration, infiltration, and we can measure the soil uh, phosphorus fractions in that. So we have to try to estimate it. It would be nice to have a separate experiment somewhere, maybe at Lukes infiltration field, where we could kind of run an experiment. But I think in Viikki, Mari Pihlati has new infrastructure. As we are building, as we have new projects, oh, yeah. I think that. But but it's it's just like it's great to have different projects and try yeah. to build up. Yeah, and, and have also they, yeah, they yeah, have yeah, soil yeah. columns yeah. Yeah. at the lab where mm. they can kind of do controlled percolation tests and measure what gets out. Yeah. Yes, and then I think very interesting question: What is the current trend of legacy phosphorus and hotspots in Finland increasing or decreasing? Uh, the, the, the phosphorus balance was highly positive in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Now it's slightly positive, like plus four kilos. But what would be necessary is to get it to highly negative, like minus seven kilos at the hotspots. And we don't know where the hotspots are. 
So, so that kind of the problem is maybe not getting better, but it's not kind of improving rapidly, and we don't know where the problem is. And you think it's around the globe? You had the question at the end for the for the audience. So I, I think is the, it similar I think the situation audience, in different I countries. The, yeah, but I think the audience kind of we have a hunch. At, at each landscape. If, if you go drive around and you see a field which is waterlogged, that you see <laughs> kind of water accumulating, it goes to the river, mm. you're like, oh, there's probably one hotspot there. Yeah. So kind of, we know some of those, but we, it would be really nice to see the map like, where's the 1% which causes the mm. 50% of the problem? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then there is a question, do you have visual illustration of the nutrient and carbon dynamics in different soil layers? No, but that would be really cool. <laughs> so, Hoping somebody will draw this if illustration. If somebody draws that, then throw that to Twitter or something. <laughs> yeah. Great. Great. Hey, perfect timing. I think we come through the questions. And uh, I remind we have time for questions at the end of the webinar. So just you can ask more from Thomas and then we come back to the questions at the end. Yeah. But the timing was perfect and very Good. clear presentation and clear answers. Thank you so much, Thomas. So we continue with the program and now we are safe. So maybe I, <laughs> I'll take this mask away. So next hour we are going to have senior scientist Kim Morasa from the Natural Resources Institute, Finland. And he's going to tell us about the pulp and paper mill fiber sludges in agricultural water projection. Actually, the minister was referring to Kimmo's artwork at, at her opening. So now we hear more about this. Thank you, Kimmo. Okay, hello everybody. Can you hear me hello. and see my presentation? Yes, perfect, Kim. Okay, okay. Hello everybody, and, and thank you very much for the minister for the nice opening of the session and and for the nice presentation. It's really good to or easy to continue from, especially from uh, Thomas' presentation because we are dealing pretty much with the same things and and phenomenon on what what Thomas explains. So my topic is re related to side streams from forest industry and how they can be used in agricultural water production. And, and there is a long list of the uh, colleagues who have been contributing to this, this uh, presentation. We have been doing quite much, uh, quite long time uh, research on, on this topic. And just briefly, I come from a National Research Institute Finland, which is a research institute with 1,300 uh, persons located in the 25 locations around Finland. And, and Lucas research is divided in four thematic areas, and, and now we are dealing pretty much in uh, about the circular bioeconomy issues because we are bringing uh, side stream from forest industry to agricultural sex sectors. And, and of course, we are dealing with the uh, profitable and responsible primary production because we are talking about agriculture and, and water production issues, but also we are talking about climate smart carbon cycles. So the, today's topics fits very well to Lucas research portfolio. And if we look how these fiber sludges end up, end up from the uh, forest sector to agriculture, we start from the from the industry, industry and and which produce paper, paper and pulp uh, products as, as as the main products of the industry, and from this production we get side stream which is called fiber sludge. The other source from the factory where we get the fiber sludges is water treatment facility. And traditionally, these fiber sludges have been incinerated as energy together with the bark. But because fiber sludges contains a lot of water, it may not be very uh, energy efficient way to dispose this material. So there could be an alternative use for these, these fiber sludges. And, and then we uh, need a company who produce uh, uh, soil improving material out of these fiber sludges. Uh, they, uh, we need the farmers who would like to use uh, this kind of uh, uh, new soil amendment in their feeds and logistics, which brings uh, the fibers finally to agriculture. So this is the business part of the, of the value uh, chain. 
and and in this agricultural end we need to make a decision when and how we use the fiber swatches in in the fields and 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 there is uh, uh, once once the decision is made we finally end the topic of the today's presentation so i will talk about uh, soil structure and not trench leaching so how this fiber sludges contribute to agricultural water protection issues. I'm talking about uh, soil carbon yields and soil mic microbes as well. And the uh, uh, results which I will show have been already published uh, uh, last year uh, in the Journal of Environmental Quality. It's open access publication, so you, uh, you, you do have access if you want to take a closer look to do this topic. So what we have done, 2015 we established a feed experiment in Jokioinen, uh, where we added composted pulp mill sludge, lime stabilized pulp mill sludge and fiber sludge uh, to soil and we had uh, unamended uh, plots as a control treatment and this uh, is quite big uh, feed experiment uh, located in the catchment area of River Loimioki. This is typical flat cereal production area where the, all the fields are self-strained. So, so basically outside of the frost period, all the water percolates, percolates through the water to the uh, drainage pipes and end up to the river. So it's a good place to use soil amendments. And if we look at the soil amendments, we have three different kinds of products taken out from the different part of the factory processes. And this fiber sludge, so for zero fiber is, is not really good, poor uh, paper kind of material. And, and this composted and lime stabilized pulp mill sludges are these brown materials. They contain phosphorus, nitrogen and cadmium. So when they are used in, in agriculture, we must always consider that that amount of those elements is well in line with the uh, present legislation. And current practice is, is that we use about 40 tons of hectare, uh, 40 tons of this material per hectare. In our experiment, we uh, added around eight tons of carbon to the soil. And of course, with the composted and lime stabilized pulp mills, we had all uh, nutrients and, and, and cadmium too. And, and we actually exceed the rates, uh, which is uh, allowed by legislation, because at that time when we started the experiment, the concentration of the materials were a bit higher than, than normally. Then I jump directly to the methods, how we measured uh, the effect of the soil amendments on soil erosion and nutrient mobilization. We used rainfall simulation test and in test, this te test starts so that we, every spring we take uh, soil monoliths by Tructon River auger from all the plots, field plots, uh, uh, and, and we take these samples to the laboratory and use artificial rainfall and, and measure the water quality that goes through the soil column. And this is a method that we have, have used quite a long time in, in MTT and, and LUKE. And, and previous results with GYPSUM indicate that, that those findings, what we have done in the laboratory, laboratory scale, predicts very well those results, what can be see, seen in the catchment scale. So this is quite feasible method to do this kind of studies and experiments. And, and as, as you can see, we measure, measure these uh, things all uh, over the four years period. And, and we have also the last year, uh, 50 year results, but they are not included in, in this presentation. They are still on table. And then we jump directly to the results. And in these slides, we are talking about suspended solids. So that's the erosion material which percolates through uh, the soil column and associated uh, total phosphorus content. So phosphorus, which is uh, related to this solid material going through the soil columns. 
And, and here in right side panel, you can see the overall treatment effect for the uh, four year uh, uh, period. And, and result shows that, that all products reduced suspension solid and total phosphorus concentration over the four year periods. And, and in the case of uh, suspended solids, uh, the concentration reduced over 60% in four, four, uh, first year, and in the fourth year, it was still over 30%. So there is de decrease over the time. Uh, there is a pretty much similar trend, trend for uh, total phosphorus uh, concentration, but however, the dissolved reactive phosphorus was not affected at all, and, and that's why the results are not presented here. Okay, one interesting finding was that, that we have quite different uh, years over this study period. Uh, this 2018 and 19 was very dry springs, and, and that actually affected the, uh, the control treatment. It was much lower, uh, concentration of suspended solids was much lower in, in this, the latter part of the ex experiment. And, and it was interesting finding and, and makes a little bit hard to estimate that how, how much we are seeing the gradually subsidizing effect of, of these amendments and how much we are seeing the trying induced improvement of, of soil structure in, in control treatment. Okay, anyway. The results are very promising from the agriculture water protection point of view, and our fifth year uh, results quite much confirm this same story. Okay, we are adding quite much organic matter to soil. 17 to uh, 14 to 17 tons in organic matter, it corresponds around eight to nine tons of organic carbon. And, and uh, we were thinking how much uh, dissolved organic carbon uh, concentrations in percolation water are affected, and, and there is slight increase, especially in, in, in the first year, although the variation is big. Uh, but but uh, it kind of stabilized over, over the time. So it's quite natural that if we increase a lot of soil organic carbon content, we might increase the leaching of the carbon as well. Uh, in leaching of uh, uh, total nitrogen, we did not see any uh, significant uh, effect over uh, over this uh, four-year peri period. But in the first year, especially in this uh, nutrient poor fiber sludge, the nutrient leaching was was reduced, and it's because of microbial immobilization of, of nitrogen and actually this affect also the yields. We will see that that when we look the yield results. Uh, all materials had slight uh, liming effect, which was seen also in, in quality of the percolation water, slight increase in, in uh, water pH. But what is even more interesting is the electrical conductivity. And this is uh, because in our previous experiment with, with Gypsum, we noticed that when water electrical conductivity increase over to 300 microsiever per, per centimeter, that promotes aggregate stability and flocculation of clay particles. In our experiment with, with these organic soil amendments, uh, Electrical conductivity remained mainly below 300 microsiemens, and and uh, then this is not the mechanism behind the improved uh, or stabilized soil structure. Instead, uh, we suppose that that uh, the mechanism behind the stabilized soil structure is is interact actions of soil minerals with added organic matter and microbe Compounds. So this is exactly the same mechanisms or topic what what Thomas presented in previous presentation. Okay, what we can see from soil samples, as it was mentioned, uh, electrical conductivity and and pH increase. We did not find any different in soil cadmium concentrations, 
And also there was no clear indication that the soil organic carbon content has increased. However, it must be uh, reminded that, that soil sampling is not very insensitive method to detect soil organic carbon. And, and uh, Yari, Yari Liski's presentation also discussed about uh, make, uh, how, how we can confirm that, that we increase soil organic carbon in, in soils. So not clear evidence. And, and to some extent, these results leans towards fast microbial decomposition of, of this organic matter. So all the organic matter, what we add to the soil doesn't remain there, but there is there is microbial microbial activity which which uh, uh, decompose decompose carbon all the time. Uh, then uh, the results of, of yields, as I already mentioned, in the first year, this nitr nitr nitrogen poor fiber sludge material decreased the yields by 14%. And, and that was kind of expected results because there is nitrogen immobilization. In the second year, we find 500 kilos higher yield from uh, lime stabilized pulp mill sludge. However, this difference was, was not statistically significant. So not really uh, clear effects for the yields in, in this experimental fields. Or, can, can, can be found, but there is other uh, research that have been focusing more in these yields effects. So we finally jump to soil microbes. Mm. So we find that the, we took the samples after three years of, of spreading this soil amendment, and we find that the, that all amendment increased fossil respiration in spring and microbiological uh, microbial biomass in autumn. And, and clearly, there was change in fungal and bacterial common composition, which can be seen here. And, and we could find that some interesting species increased, which have been linked for, ex for, for example, intensive or less intensive land use typical in organic farming, or uh, species which are beneficial for nutrient uptake and species that is known to be efficient aggregator in soil. However, this kind of uh, experimental setup uh, do not allow uh, our uh, like to make a clear evidence, scientific evidence stance that microbial activity uh, explains improved soil stability, but, but there is still many positive associations. And I think that this is a um, I, I think more like a global question that the soil microbiological issues and, and their effect to soil function is they are, it's, it's not very well, very easy to, to prove that to, those links. We know that they, they exist and we have an idea how they work, but, but proving them in, in specific experiment is, is not that easy. OK, now I would like to summarize my presentation to, to these slides. Uh, yes, the fiber use of these fibers seems to be very promising water protection measures. And, and we are uh, kind of extending our research to the catchment scale because the uh, results are so, so promising in the field scale in, in, in those results which I just presented. And there is a Kuitu project uh, financed by Vesensuolin Tehostamisohjelma, where we are about to add fibers to the catchment scale in, in this autumn and measure the water quality after that. Then there is many other projects dealing with the fibers. Biosphere project in, in Maninka is there we added fibers to coarse textured soils. VV project starts. Uh, in these springs, where we studied the fiber sludge use in vegetable production, we have some more financing will where we uh, studied, uh, uh, learn new techniques, how to see effects on, on, on soil structure and, and also look really into nanoscale what happens in soil surfaces 
with helium ion microscopic technologies. There is also a EU board project focusing on soil microbi microbiology. And, and some newcomers, we have just re received new financing, uh, which also deals with these same issues with fiber sludges. So this was my presentation. I hope you have really nice question for me. Yes, thank you, Kimmo, so much for the very clear presentation. And I was happy to see the last, was it Horizon Projects on the, as we were discussing with Thomas about the soil microbes and the soil microbial communities. We know that they play a very crucial role, but we do not know so much about them yet. So that you have continuous project funding and con because I think it's really interesting how the sludge is affected the microbial sort of composition and the microbial ecology in the soil. And what does that mean for the soil aggregation? And as you pointed out, it's it's not a, sort of like a clear evidence, but there is, I'm sure, a lot to do research on on that topic. Yes, and then we have a question. Yes, yes, please. Uh, okay, yeah, go yeah. on. <laughs> no, no, but you can know. No, you can answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is that is very very uh, timely question and and interesting question, and and we must to connect those microbial mm. findings to those what we see in soil functions, like an interaction with leaching and soil structure and. And, and we are in good track and we would like to continue to continue that work. And if maybe to continue that, maybe you could think that you could have really long term effects if you can really change the microbial composition or the ecology in the soil. So maybe then the effects would be more long lasting. But then to the questions, uh, there is a question uh, that how will the Yoki Oinen field test continue? Do you have plans on the Yoki Oinen? A very interesting field test you have there. Okay, yeah, that's true. So we started 2015 and, and there is uh, five years uh, hard work behind and, and last autumn we actually applied this fiber material second time field. So we repeated, uh, repeated the application and this is something which is totally new. New thing that, that we have five year per periods, period and then reapplication, and now we continue the following. And one of those new projects, actually, which was in red uh, in, in my slide, uh, is focusing to continue these similar studies in the field. And all, all, of course, we are trying to expand the research with the microbes and, and other things in, in this field. So, Jokinen field experiment will go on and we will get really nice and interesting results from there. Thank you, Kimo. That was good news. And then we have interesting question about the DOC dissolved organic carbon leakage. Uh, how much did the DOC leakage increase on average? For some fields seemed to increase by 200 to 300 percent. Was this correct? Oh, I don't remember the percentage how much there was significant effect for the dissolved organic carbon leaching, at least in, in some uh, materials, but, but I cannot give the uh, percentage numbers, I don't remember those. But, uh, but it, it is an inter inter interesting question and, and we have to follow, follow what happens in the next round after the reapplication for the for so organic camp carbon, because if there is already existing organic cap carbon and, and we add once mm. it is more than then the effect might be even more pronounced. But let's see. So it's good that the experiment continues on that since also. And then a question actually relates to the opening of the minister also a question that how would you describe the differences and potential of soil improvements, fibers, structure lime and gypsum in water protection? Yes, that's it. That is good question. And, and my opinion is that we need all of those. They are they can be used in parallel because all the fields are, you can use one material in all fields, but you have to decide which is the best for this special uh, feed parcels and select which which of the materials you used. So I think there is a place for all all these three three methods and 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 together together they will provide good opportunity to improve quality of the Baltic Sea. 
Thank you. That was very, very clear answer. And then I remind that please, if you uh, have comments on Twitter, on social media, use the hashtag Carbon Action, and we will take questions from the social media, from the Twitter also. And then there is one final question before we go to the coffee break. Are uh, uh, pulp mill sludges already utilized in agriculture? How is this done in practice and how do the farmers take it? Are they pleased with the sludges? Yes, uh, it mm -hmm. is commercial business at the, at the moment. And actually, I wrote a blog uh, in in the Kuitu project web, web page, and and there was number. So uh, last year, it fibers were spread for the 1,400 uh, hectares, and that, that, that's commercial business. So so it seems that farmers are really willing to take fibers. Thank you. Is the blog in English or Finnish? We can maybe it's add in, it to the... It is unfortunately in Finnish. Okay, but we can still add it to the, to the discussion. So thank you so much, Kimo. Perfect timing again, because now it is time for us to go on a coffee break. We have coffee here at the, our studio, but I hope every, wherever you are listening, at your home store where you are listening, that you have now a nice break for coffee. And then we continue the program. Uh, at 10.30, at and that is Finnish time, 10.30. So I guess we have different time zones here, but half past, 10 minutes coffee break. Thank you.
such a nice time here here at our coffee break at the studio that we almost lost track of time. But now it is uh, half past and we're ready to continue our webinar. So this webinar is on soil carbon sequestration and water protection. If some of you are joining us only now after the coffee break. So now after the coffee break, is, it is time to go to the Baltic Sea. So we are going to hear about carbon nutrient and particle loading in coastal waters of the northern Baltic, how to target and evaluate countermeasures in a cost efficient way. And we are going to hear about case study from Hanko and Rasepori by Matthias Shining from the city of Hanko. So Matthias, please. OK, yes. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, I'll just share my screen. Um. Here. OK. Yes. Hello. I suppose you can see the presentation. Yeah, perfect. OK, great. And nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, hello. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk here today. Um, <clears throat> although I'll be talking about two projects today. The focus will be almost completely on House Manual and Two. We're just beginning our work with the sequel. And <clears throat> I'd like to start out by telling you that this talk has a rather unorthodox structure. Um, the main focus will be on our perspective on the coastal environment. And this is absolutely necessary because the novel methods and applications that I'll go through quicker totally build upon this slightly unconventional perspective. And as, as you're scanning through the outline here, I'd like to use the opportunity to thank those that have actually made this work possible. We've received substantial funding from the Baris Rodin and Sophia von Julien's Foundation and from the Ministry of the Environment as a part of the program for intensified water protection. Uh, the city of Hanko has done a great job administrating the project, which is owned by the Pro Litore Foundation. And last but not least, a big thanks to the Carbon Action Platform for inviting us in. OK, I just talked about an unconventional perspective, but let's start out with a traditional view. There are quite a few reasons why we should be interested in the movement of carbon and nutrients in the environment. Generally speaking, these building blocks of life determine ecosystem status, of course, together with the physical circumstances. And with the status of ecosystems, I refer to their fundamental properties, their structure, functioning, and the services that they can provide. Um, today I'll be focusing on the role of coastal waters in the transportation and transformation of carbon and nutrients. Basically, these elements flow across and within different ecosystems in dissolved and particulate forms. They're everywhere, bound to organisms or non-living particles, freely dissolved in the water or as gases in the air and so forth. Instead of trying to track down all the different chemical compounds and physical forms, we can get a pretty good idea of what these arrows over here are about by focusing on so-called status indicators. But before we move on, I want to mention that even though the arrows here refer generally to the flow of energy and matter, we can now start thinking about them in terms of loading. And more specifically, in terms of carbon, nutrient and particle loading. Um, the idea here is that the values of status indicators are proportional to the kind and amount of loading that's influencing the system, as well as the prevailing biochemical and physical conditions. This is, of course, not our own idea. There are thousands of publications about the application of aquatic indicators. Anyway, indicators such as dissolved organic matter, turbidity, chlorophyll A, they reflect the status of carbon, nutrient and particle loading in a system basically taking into account the fact that the different chemical compounds and physical forms are all the time being transformed and redistributed within the system. Another reason for why I wanted to bring forth these concrete examples already here is that together these particular indicators not only reflect how heavily the system is influenced by loading, they are also crucially important for assessing how the ecosystem is doing in terms of, for instance, eutrophication, accumulation of sediment, trophic transfer efficiency, acidification, 
extent of the photic zone, the capacity to bind atmospheric carbon, and so on. And together with the physical circumstances, these indicators essentially tell how the living conditions in the water or its ecological status look like. Okay, let's move on. We're especially interested in these linkages, that is, how terrestrial loading will influence the status of coastal waters and thereby the climate. Now, let's take a closer look at the terrestrial loading and pick as an example, some site where we have apparent terrestrial loading going on, a river, for instance. Basically, the mouth of the river is a sort of like a hotspot where terrestrial matter originating from the whole catchment area will be funneled into the sea. And to get an idea of the amount of loading that's entering the sea through the river mouth, we'll need to add a third dimension to our diagram, time. Obviously, the, the amount of loading from the river will vary with time. So let's do repeated measurements right at the river mouth and a tiny bit further away at the sea. And to make a case in point, let's analyze these samples for a specific nutrient compound and a specific status indicator. Let's have a look at how the values will look like on a seasonal timeline. We can first look at the panels on the left side. No matter if we look at the status indicator or the nutrient compound, the temporal variation will be huge. The concentrations will vary from day to day, and there are some few really sharp peaks, which stand for a large part of the annual loading. Then we can compare the lower figures with each other. No matter if we measure our nutrient compound in the river or outside of it in the sea, the concentrations will still vary on a daily basis. Besides, each other almost at all. This is because the nutrient compound will get transformed as it's being transported. Now, we have one panel left, the one in the upper right corner. And when we measure, measure a status indicator in the sea, there is still quite some seasonal variability. But the curve looks way smoother than the others. And on top of that, it actually resembles the loading coming from the river. Okay, I hope I've managed to make two meaningful to determine loading based on its effects than on the individual causes. And second, seasonal variation is something to reckon with, especially in our latitudes. Now, we can take one step closer to the real world. This means a change of perspective, and not only physically, but also when it comes to conventions. I'll move on to talk about spatial variation with focus on terrestrial loading. First of all, runoff from land is by no means restricted to a single river. Besides, there are countless smaller streams and creeks. And then, there's quite a patchwork of man-made ditches. And finally, freshwater runoff and thereby terrestrial loading is by no means confined to running waters in general. Basically, uh, water can seep out into the sea just anywhere along the coastline. This is called direct runoff. So when we talk about diffuse loading, we're really not talking about only about rivers, but also about smaller creeks, ditches, and virtually the entire shoreline. Um, this is just to visualize what happens with terrestrial loading in the sea. The fresh water with the terrestrial matter will get mixed with the seawater in both horizontal and vertical directions. This also means mixing with loading from other sources, and more specifically, background loading from the open sea and internal loading from the seafloor. Basically, both of these are linked to historical terrestrial loading. But in any case, um, to assess the loading into coastal waters, it's especially important to focus on the horizontal dimensions. Now we can simulate another kind of sampling. We could measure a given indicator variable with regular intervals on a transect that follows the coastline. We'll start out at the arrowhead and stop at the circle. So this time, these measurements can be accompanied with simultaneous measurements of the prevailing physical conditions. And since we've already concluded that seasonal variation is important, we'll repeat the measurements at a number of different times of the year. And while we're at it, we can also repeat the measurements at different times of the day. Okay, if we now look at the lower graph, 
we can see an expected outcome, considerable spatial or horizontal variation, as shown by the green line representing the temporal mean. There's also quite a bit of seasonal variation, shown by the gray confidence intervals, and a tiny bit of diurnal variation, shown by the white confidence intervals. But then, in the upper panel, displaying physical conditions, the patterns are really similar. Does this mean that the state of the environment is more or less pre predetermined by its physical characteristics? The answer would be yes, but with emphasis on the more or less. Predicting the status of the environment based on its physical characteristics may be useful on its own right. So first, we'll need to pick a random and representative subset of data from the whole data set. This is important since we're interested in correlations between variable values that shouldn't be autocorrelated in space or time. Now, we could apply our predictions to our whole survey area, but why should we predict something that we've already measured? Because of the anomalies in every single data point, we can now compare the measured indicator values with those predicted by the environmental conditions. The predictions will provide reference values to find what would be normal considering the prevailing physical circumstances. And the deviations from those values will reveal patterns of variation in loading that are not, or at least less, confounded by the environmental conditions, especially the vertical and horizontal mixing of water, uh, changes in precipitation and other climate effects. Okay. Before moving on to a more concrete level, let's have one more look at the vertical arrow in our schematic diagram. The amount of loading and physical conditions should obviously correlate with how much greenhouse gases are produced in the environment. We're especially interested in how terrestrial loading acts as fuel and the prevailing physical conditions as facilitators in these processes. And therefore, on top of status indicators and physical conditions, we're also measuring concentrations of methane and carbon dioxide in surface waters, right at the interface between the sea and the atmosphere. Okay, I basically already told you what our projects are about, but let's take, take this in more concrete terms. So far, we've been focusing on this coastal area in southwestern Finland. We have a roughly 500 nautical mile or 900 kilometer long transect, where we measure a set of environmental indicators and variables describing the physical conditions. This is done with an underway at five second intervals, just below and above the surface. This results in about 20,000 observations per sampling occasion. And so far, we've done 17 campaigns like this. Here, in this table, you can see what kind of information is being logged and when. The information can be roughly divided into four categories. There are obviously the spatial and temporal tags for everything. Um, a set of physical conditions are being measured both in the air and in the water. And then there are six different indicator variables over here. And the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. I've also added here some examples of variables that can be reliably derived from the actual measurements. And for validation and calibration purposes, we've also been collecting quite a few discrete water samples, mainly for different nutrient com compounds. They're shown in red down at the bottom. Okay, here, just a quick look at what the underway system looks like. As the boat's moving, the system is pumping in water at a constant rate of 30 liters per minute from here. And before the water is led to the sensors, it will pass through a so-called de-bubbler. None of our sensors really like bubbles. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the map I showed to you, this should give some sort of an impression about the environmental variability in the study area. Okay. After collecting and calibrating data, the data, they can be plotted on the map and interpolated like this. 
here you can see the annual means of 2020 for the three most central indicator variables, chlorophyll A, turbidity, and fluorescent dissolved organic matter. The actual sampling transect is shown in the lower panel on the left side. Um, but now, if we replace that panel with a map displaying the annual mean salinity in the area and compare the picture with the one on the right or with any other picture, we can see that the patterns really are quite identical. They also corroborate the conventional view that the inner and middle parts of the archipelago are mostly affected by terrestrial influence, largely determined by the level of freshwater input. This is interesting, but nothing really new. So now let's get back to the anomalies or the deviations. Here, we've used a random subset of our data to predict some status indicator values on the basis of the other variables we're measuring. So let's focus on the most important indicator, the FDOM on the left. Just by using salinity, temperature, and the time of the year as explanatory variables in a simple linear regression model, we can explain about 95% of the variation in FDOM values. Although this is just a subset of about 1,500 observations, we can still see that some values deviate quite a bit from the expected. But what we want from this is the model formula with its parameter values. Those can be applied to the whole data set and compared with the actual measurement values. So here, we plot the deviations on the map, and the patterns are quite different compared with those based on the raw data. And yeah, the units here are standard deviation units. So they vary depending on the variable. Essentially, here we can see where the environment is doing better or worse than expected based on the physical conditions. And more importantly, since the indicator values have been normalized, to take into account variability in the environmental conditions or the envi environmental type, the gradient here can lead us towards the actual problem sources. And not only those on land, but also those that are related to internal loading or background loading from the open sea. Okay, this will bring us to the concrete applications. We've already been using this information in prioritizing and targeting concrete management actions. Here the purple box highlights the hotspot of terrestrial loading. So this is an area in northwestern Rasebori where terrestrial loading turned out to be higher than expected based on the prevailing conditions. Here we collaborated with Soil Food, a company specialized in sustainable agriculture to treat sources of agricultural runoff in such a way that would be beneficial not only for the recipient waters, but also for the agricultural profitability. The area shown on the aerial pictures were treated with soil amendment fiber together with a suit of supporting actions. The data collection from the waters continued right away after the treatments and the preliminary results, they look really promising. What we're expecting in the longer term is not only increased water quality, but also decreased greenhouse gas emissions from the waters. In this context, I want to highlight again that the follow-up monitoring is based on indicator values that have been normalized to environmental circumstances, such as water mixing and climate effects. This means that we can relate the changes in water quality more reliably to the actual treatments, as the measurements are compared with environment-specific reference values. So now I presented a single case as an example, but I'd really like you to remember that we're basically monitoring a large coastal area in a continuous manner. That means that our data can be used for following up and evaluating the effects of any positive or negative actions associated with the coastal waters in the region. In general, the approach has unlimited resolution also in the vertical direction. And as the approach can be freely scaled and duplicated, it's applicable pretty much anywhere, such as in freshwaters. And then finally, to the connection between terrestrial loading, coastal waters, and the climate. Here are two sequences of observations, one from mid-spring 2020 and the other from mid-autumn 2020. In the lower panel, we have surface water carbon dioxide concentrations, and in the upper one, methane concentrations. Additionally, both panels have been split up into the first thing that catches the eye here is probably the really high concentrations. Conventionally, surface water methane concentrations would be reported in nanomoles per liter. Here, micromoles will do better since we're dealing with concentrations that are an order of magnitude higher than in the surrounding open sea areas. And as for carbon dioxide, 
we could put a pretty telling reference line at 400 ppm. That's roughly what we find in the air. We've quite often been measuring concentrations 25 times as high as that. And if we look at the mean levels, we have reason to believe that our coastal waters act rather as a source than a sink for atmospheric carbon. Another feature that I want to highlight here is the spatial and seasonal variability. This really corroborates the point that future sampling efforts should be focused on these scales. And finally, the methane concentrations in the fall, the, the light red line, show a really strong and general diurnal trend as opposed to carbon dioxide. At this stage, it means that we'll definitely be putting more effort to covering and understanding diurnal variation in methane concentrations. Well, in what sort of conditions do we then have hotspots of methane and carbon dioxide? As it was probably apparent already by looking at the graphs in the previous slide, there's virtually no spatial or temporal correlation between the concentrations of the two greenhouse gases. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be common denominators. Now, this is all really preliminary, but at the moment, the situation looks like this. High surface water concentrations of both methane and carbon dioxide are associated with high terrestrial loading. And some part of this terrestrial matter turns into carbon dioxide already before entering the sea and almost immediately after that, really close to the shore, and especially when it's warm and the respiration rates are high. Another part of the terrestrial matter will move on further towards the open sea and gradually sink downwards. And after a considerable lag, this will be associated with high surface water methane concentrations. But once more, I really want to emphasize that this is very speculative. We still have quite a bit of work to do to define the conditions for which greenhouse gas concentrations, for the high greenhouse gas concentrations, I mean, not to even mention understanding the processes behind their formation. And yeah, speaking about the future, at least for the next three years, we'll be focusing on diffuse loading and direct runoff, the gray areas in the picture within a larger area than before. Running surveys within the red rectangle will be intensifying our collaboration with environmental authorities in evaluating the impacts of different positive and negative anthropogenic influences in the area. We'll also dig deeper into our older data from the very first House Manuel project to analyze the interactions between macrophyte community composition and the fluxes of oxygen and greenhouse gases. We'll try to incorporate the topographical characteristics of the catchment areas into our predictive models for the status indicators and that way to evaluate the connection between different land use practices and terrestrial loading. And finally, we'll use our current data to target vertical and diurnal sampling efforts to understand more about the patterns and processes of greenhouse gas production in coastal waters. All right, then I think it's time to say thank you. And we still have about three minutes for questions. <laughs> Yes, okay. thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. And I'm so happy that you came to the Carbon Action Platform. It's such so important to really see what's happening in the Baltic Sea, what is happening in the coastal area, because it's a really rare situation that you can really see the effects on, on the on the water, on the coastline. A lot of work, a lot of sampling, a lot of driving around with, with the port. It's really an excellent, excellent work, work you are doing there. Uh, there is no direct question, but but I could I think really interesting. Of course, it was really interesting to see how it really nicely linked to Kimmo's presentation about the sludges, that now you can see the effects sort of of the sludges there when you're monitoring from from the from the coastal line and it looks very positive. So could you re uh, reflect on Kimmo's presentation? Can you sort of see that when you listen to Kimmo's results and and your monitoring, you can see maybe there's a sort of it's supporting each other's those results, do you find? Yeah, I mean, we certainly hope that they are supporting each other. I mean, that's the expe expectation that we had, that that doing these treatments would have a positive effect on the wa water quality. And of course, now we're in the process of evaluating these effects. It's of course a little bit too early. That's why I didn't really want to put any results about that, because the treatments were done last fall. So just like half a year ago or so and of course i mean we did some monitoring after that but it's 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 i mean i it's kind of hard to draw any conclusions but as i briefly mentioned the the preliminary results that we have look really really promising and i think that during next next year when we will continue with our sampling i i, I think or I'm, I'm quite confident that we will be seeing more of these positive outcomes 
Thank you, Matthias. And now we have a few questions. How do your measurements compare with historic data from the area? What do your figures tell about the trend? Uh, that's one of the things that we will be working on in, in, in the future, actually. Now we've been totally focusing on the spatial variation, kind of like this uh, re replacing time with space kind of an approach. But yeah, we'll definitely, or somebody should definitely dig deeper into these old data. Of course, they don't have the same resolution, but then these long-term time series, of course, have a really huge value. And, 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 and for basically, I mean, we basically define our own baselines or reference values for what we're measuring. I mean, the central indicators. But then, of course, what we don't know based on our own measurement is how these waters used to look like. And this would be another really, really important way of defining defining this, basically the ecological baselines. I still take one question, a very good question, uh, stating very interesting your presentation, giving thanks to your presentation, but do you have any idea what is behind the high coastal loading? Maybe animal husbandry, bare soils, poor soil structure or what? What about the role of forestry, clear cuts and ditching? This is a very uh, <laughs> yeah, that, topical that's a, question. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's, a, that's a really that's good a question. question. And, yeah, and of course, I mean, it will take time to find answers to those questions. But this Hobbs Manuel and three, our sequel project that I briefly mentioned mm -hmm. here, I mean, one of the points with that project would be to start taking more into, I mean, now, now we can basically um, lead our way towards these terrestrial loading mm -hmm. sources on land, but we're pretty much limited to the resolution in, with which we can define the different catchment areas. I mean, basically the digital elevation models. But then there is quite a bit of information about like land, land use, soil structure or soil type and so on. And this is definitely something mm. that we plan to, uh, as I was explaining, basically how, how, how we define our reference values. So in statistical terms, you could see that you could, you could also use these uh, variables describing these cat catchment areas. Now I mean like land use and mm. so forth. So, so you could use these variables also in the predictive models for the reference values. And this is actually what we're going to do in the future so that we can analyze the effects or better analyze the effects of land use, for instance. And I mean, one of the grand questions would, of course, mm. be like this kind of like agriculture mm. versus forestry. Mm. Exactly. And then but that's part of the future work. And then Sorry. target measures, and then target measures accordingly. Or accordingly, so really interesting work, and we are looking for for these new results. But I think now we go on. We have still some questions, but we take them at the end when we have the final discussion. So thank you again, and we move on. Thank you. Now we are going to have Airi Kulmala from the Central Union of Agricultural Producers and Forest Owners, and as a commentary. Uh, for for all this, you've heard Airi a lot of interesting presentations. So to have your commentary talk about this all. Please, Airi. Can you Thank you. hear us? Thank yes. You. Yes, I think it's, yeah. I don't know what happens now. Okay. Okay, great. Now we can see the slide. Great, Airi, yes. Fine. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate uh, participate this webinar and give a few comments about it. We have heard really interesting interesting scientific results and what is going on, but now we move move to the practical level on the farm. And my presentation is based on our water program, and I try to think how it's correlated with these presentations. Uh, as we know, agriculture and forestry depend on water. 
and water protection is an important part of the activities at farms. And we need, really need, uh, and it's really true that water protection is an integral part of responsible and susta sustainable Finnish agriculture and forestry. And this importance of water protection also encourages us to make these MTKs and SLCs a water program. We think that good agriculture and forestry practices are the basis of water protection, but then this can be supplemented by additional measures like the use of gypsum or fibers or whatever is needed, but the basic things need to be in good shape first. MTK and SLC are Finnish agricultural unions, Finnish speaking and Swedish speaking unions. And we did uh, this kind of water program at the end of last year. And the purpose of our program is to tell about the water protection work done by our members. We all the time hear that farmers and forest owners are not doing enough, but we want to tell that we really do a lot of things. We want to also to bring up the topics to improve the efficiency of water management. We emphasize how important measured data and results are when water protection measures are implemented. And we encourage to increase know-how in every level. Scientists need more knowledge, uh, advisory needs more, and farmers need more. And of course, we can always do things better. And so, we, so there are also examples to our members how they can improve their water protection work. We have already heard the importance of soils. Like, to, uh, like, for example, Thomas told us. And we also think that a good soil structure and water management are the basis of soil fertility, for fertility and they are also the first step in water protection. And organic matter is an important part of soil quality and it has many effects in soil, as Thomas told us. By taking care of the soil's organic matter, we also affect how plants grow and utilize nutrients. And this has, of course, the effect to the risk of leaching. The better crop utilize nut given nutrients, the smaller the risk of leaching. Beside environmental reasons, financial losses due to the leaching of nutrients are also a very good motivator to farmers to keep losses as small as possible. And then one important thing that the most of the load occurs outside the growing season, but we do the work for waters largely during the growing season. Uh, I mean with this that we really need to think already in growing season, at which state we, for example, leave our fields over the winter. Are they on stubble? Should there be a green cover? Should they be plowed? Or whatever has happened. And also, if we use these cover crops, we need to decide that already growing season. But then they help outside the growing season. It is predicted that climate change will increase uh, challenges of water protection. There will be more rain in autumn and in winter. And it means that there will be higher risk of erosion and leaching of nutrients in winter. And we also lose 
the positive effect of frost on clay soil structure when winters are uh, coming milder and there is more uh, more rain. And organic matter is important factor how we can reduce this risk due to increased risk due to the climate change. We have, as I said, we have done already a lot. And effect of phosphorus fertilization limits can be seen on our phosphorus balances and a lower peak contents in soils. In three decades, phosphorus balances has decreased almost 90 percent, uh, 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 decrease about 80 percent. And we can also see that the proportion of soil samples with really high pay consensus is decrease. Re and hopefully in the future, these trends also can be seen at, in, at the water quality. There, the, these both reduce the risk of phosphorus leaching and actually phosphorus load has re decreased almost 20% since 1995. But because other things are putting uh, trends to other direction, these values seem to be quite low for some, uh, some people and we can't see really uh, effects on seas just by looking our eyes. How we should pro um, proceed? It's really important to improve the fertility of soils also in the future. Uh, as we heard from Thomas, the risk of nutrient load is not always the same and we need to target those cost-effective cost water protection measures based on discharge risks. And we also need to measure uh, those methods based what we want, what kind of load we want to reduce. We need to select different measures when we want to reduce um, uh, uh, soluble phosphorus or erosion phosphorus. In the future, precision farming and digitalization in the planning and implementation of farming practices is more important. And we need contract contracting services and sharing of machinery uh, that also those smaller farms can utilize these newest technologies. And in, cer in certain areas in Finland, there is also clearing of new fields, uh, mainly for purposes of manure spreading. We should reduce that and it can be due by increasing cooperation between between farms and um, parcel arrangements and rot uh, rotation. We also need boost uh, nutrient recycling and those parcels which are poorly pr productive, we need to, we can uh, utilize them to promote biodiversity or for uh, use for forestation. Ideally, the same matter can be used to protect waters, reduce air emissions and take care of biodiversity. One example of those methods can be, for example, um, cover pl uh, plants. And then this knowledge. Uh, long term receipts and monitoring data is really needed. We need the data that we know what is the effectiveness of measures. We need them to select measures, target them and dimensioning of them. And we also model development. Uh, I mean those uh, nutrient load model, uh, models. We need the data that we can develop them. And we need data to eval evaluate the cost efficiency and decision making in farm level and also by authorities. 
And when we get the new results, results they uh, should be moved quickly from receipts to practice to advisors, advisory services and uh, other communication. And if we want to, uh, and we need also to think next generation, we need good education about these water issues in agricultural and forestry schools. And we also uh, um, communicate towards consumers that they know what we do and what are, and they can uh, select uh, and uh, utilize this information when they select what they what kind of food they uh, buy from stores. We can go towards a good status of waters through good agricultural and forestry uh, practices using cost effective and well targeting measures uh, uh, through catchment area specific planning and by applying more precise receipts data and by increasing know-how. That was what I wanted to tell you now and more information you can find, find on in our web page. Thank you. Thank you, Ari, for the very clear presentation. And uh, I can't see any direct questions uh, to your presentation, but uh, maybe just to, to point out that sort of according what we've heard today, it was very important point about how the results, you have to take the results into the practice and take it to the farmers. And I this, this is something that Carbon Action is very strongly promoting yes. by this cooperation. But thank you so much. And, and now, please, for the audience. Now you can pose questions to all of the speakers here. We have Tuomas here to answer and the others are online. I will uh, now start the discussion by taking some questions that were posed earlier, but we did not have time for them. So warning for Professor Jariliski. There are a few questions we didn't have time to have. Is Jari there online? <laughs> Laura, I'm yes. here. I, yeah, I'm yeah, just... great, you are there. So quite a specific question. In the slide with the day and the night carbon sink source graph, there uh, was a clear pump in July where it became a net source. Is that after harvest? And how was this measured? Yes, that was indeed uh, uh, a result of the of a harvesting event when the one one harvest of this uh, forest grass was collected from from the field, and the measurement is uh, is uh, taken using a, a methodology called eddy covariance methodology. That is a methodology that automatically all the time follows the uh, carbon dioxide flux between the atmosphere and the field. So that is uh, like. Uh, uh, taking the measurements day and night, uh, summer and winter, even at that this very moment that we are talking about here. But that was exactly the uh, the pump was a result of the harvesting effect. I was I, I took it there as an example that the the methods measurement methods that we use they're really sensitive to those management effects, mm. which are very important for for quantifying the carbon sequestration. I hope this answers the question. That's really clear answer and maybe referring to Iris presentation that those results are of course of great interest to the farmers and for sort of for the practice to see that how 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 these different practices affect the carbon sequestration. Yeah, Laura, if I, if I may, may comment, yes, that, that's also the kind of the, I also, after that slide, I, I uh, presented or mentioned this field observatory, but that what yes. we have been developing and Tuomas also mentioned how that is used also in this kind of a nutrient uh, cycling work that that we're doing and exactly it has many purposes that one of the purposes is that is that the farmers could really see the effects mm. of the management practices that they do and that is of course sort of a encourages mm. to, to carry on and then also you know to select the, the effective ones from the less effective ones in order to see the effects but the, that, that's one of the functions that we have been thinking of when developing this field observatory and i can confirm yes. I can confirm that farmers are nowadays really interested in carbon sequestration and carbon cycles and how can they develop their farms and they really want to see quickly results from finished conditions and this is really good work what is doing by different organizations and receipts and so on. 
Yes. Yeah, I've been really happy now with this carbon action to see these 100 carbon farmers when we have a different kind of intensive training where you have the researchers and the farmers together, how sort of intensive and how, how keen everybody is to learn from each other. But then I think one further question, I think this is Yari for you, or then you can pass it on to the next if it's not for you. Uh, what is the time horizon of the carbon sequestration estimates? Um, yes, so the... Uh I think it needs to be, uh, it needs to be, well, they need to extend a few decades into the future because when quantifying the carbon sequestration, it is important to quantify not only how much go carbon goes into the soil this year, but it's also essential to know that how much of this carbon is additional, so a result of the additional activity carried out on that on that farm and another thing that is important to, to know is that before how long does the carbon stay in the soil mm. so the longevity and the permanence of the carbon that the additional carbon that we have been able to sequester into the soil and that is also something we also need to uh, in our economic analysis mm. is also important to develop uh, methods how to handle situations when the kind of the sequestration uh, rate if it increases if it slows down or if we even lose some of the carbon that we have been able to sequester into the soil so that is one of the things that we are how we're sort of linking our uh, natural science work to our economic analysis mm -hmm. to develop the kind of the economy of of this uh, carbon carbon farming and how that is then relevant for uh, designing the policies and different other incentives and uh, uh, regulation mechanisms for this carbon sequestration. But it's, it's important to, to understand that even though the uh, kind of the forecast or the estimates need to extend to say 30 years, 50 years into the future, maybe even longer, then the actions of carbon farming, they, they you know, they, they, they take place. Uh, like sort of every day or every year, every season. So it's, it's we need to be able to handle these different kind of uh, like uh, understand the uh, the rapid changes and also understand the long term changes. And that is why I mentioned that the, in the first phase we are adding this 15 day forecast of carbon sequestration into our field uh, observatory. And the 15 days comes from that we have our weather forecast for the next 15 mm -hmm. days that we, that we can use. But in a later phase, I would say already at the end of this year, we will be, we will be adding these like uh, decades long estimates of carbon sequestration also to the field observatory. That was a very relevant question. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting and clear answer. Uh, I could actually ask Thomas if, if you want to join me here, so I don't have to talk alone here. Yeah. And I have the next question for you. And it was it was about the legacy of phosphorus, surprisingly. And it was about question how to measure. Is it easy to measure legacy phosphorus? Oh, yeah. Uh, in general, yeah. Uh, if you go to like really accurate measurement, then it's less uh, easy. But kind of a generally accepted way is to do a melic tree extraction, which is an agronomic soil test, which can extract phosphorus, iron and aluminium at the same time. And then you compare the phosphorus concentration to iron and aluminium, which reflect the amount of uh, sorption surfaces in the soil. And then this relationship is when it goes above 10%, so like Phosphorus saturates 10% of saturation surfaces, you start to get increased risk of runoff. So, but, so basically, take a good soil test, send it to a lab, calculate a bit. Sounds done. very easy. Very easy. <laughs> not, 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 you don't have to invent anything and you don't have to do the measurements yourself because uh, commercial labs do those all the time. And not maybe so expensive. That sort of no, I, I think it, it was around. Twenty dollars per sample, or okay. maybe thirty dollars per sample, when okay. we analyze those. Yeah. Okay, then we have actually next question to you, Thomas. Uh, what actions or what kind of research is needed to find out the hotspots of phosphorus on Finnish fields? Uh, the I would really like to replicate the, the Irish study, which used a lidar uh, laser scanning mapping of the topography, and then calculating how water flows and using that to kind of highlight potential risks and then uh, get soil samples from like, if, if the leader shows that 
that there's 10% of the land area is high risk, then take some soil samples there and see if kind of high legacy phosphorus is at the same spot with poor water flow. So that, that would be one approach. Another approach would be like, like Matthias uh, presented there, that, that kind of driving around in a boat and seeing where the concentrations jump because all just going around along ditch network to mm. kind of see where does the loading increase that would be another really good way to sample it then we have a lot of questions about carbon markets but before before going to that uh, i could ask kim one specific question what are the bottlenecks of more common utilization of pulp based soil amendments on farms yes thank, thanks for the question uh, so I do not have data on that, so this is more like my own uh, opinion, but I, I think it's the middle part of the second slide of my presentation for where was this kind of business part of the value network. So we need to get more fibers, more, more, more good quality fibers from the, from the forest industry and, and uh, enhance the markets and availability of the materials because already farmers are using using those materials and I don't see any restriction why why it would not increase. So Thank you. This is Thank my you. yes, I would say. And then to Airi, how do you see a role of the agricultural subsidies to control nutrient loading? How can crop cover be increased in hotspot areas? And I guess the others can also answer, <laughs> but if Iris starts with this question. Uh, uh, of course, those subsidies has a really uh, hu uh, and huge effect on uh, water protection that we can uh, at uh, different uh, at we can use different kind of measures. But as I said, we need more targeting that we find those most uh, risky areas where we can put them. And if you think about this southwestern Finland area and archipelago sea area the problem is that we don't have those animals who eat uh, hay and so on then we need something some kind of some other type of uh, plant cover or then we need or uh, we need uh, um, like biomass production, um, bio, bio gas production, or something else, where we can utilize that bio, um, those plants. And cover crops, of course, can be used wherever we want to use them because it's not purpose to harvest them. Thank you. Yes, short. Then we have so many questions, but okay. short. But yes, please. Very short. A, a few challenges that were in the previous <laughs> cap was that the kind of if it's only less than 10% which are the hotspots now in the previous cap 70% of Finnish fields were targeted as the target area for hotspot mitigation so it would be great to kind of narrow that down and get more resources to the actual hotspots and the other thing which kind of uh, I hope gets fixed is that the mixing of stubble and green cover so that like stubble is considered plant covered although it's not plant covered it's dead plant covered so these two would get fixed then i think a lot of things would get fixed so it's not only what but it's also how yeah yes. yeah also how that's really and then i would like to have for matthias about the matthias research this question that can this your method matthias be used in identifying hotspots and to target measures accordingly. And also to continue the question, uh, the more eutrophied a sea is, the more it pins carbon, or is it so? What is your view on this? Um, yeah, so that's basically two questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> if, if, if I'm interpreting this right. Um, yeah, uh, the answer to the first question would be that that's basically what we're already doing. I mean, we're using the data uh, our or some of our main collaborators are actually the environmental authorities in the region where we work, especially the municipal authorities. And we are directly providing all this data also in such a format that it's easily interpretable. 
for the authorities to target management actions in a cost-efficient way. Um, and of course, as long as we can continue with our work, we will also be able to monitor or evaluate the impact of these actions. And then the second question, uh, sorry, could you please <laughs> repeat that? I'm not sure if I remember it completely. Uh, it was about the carbon. Um, yeah, if, um, if the more eutrophied a sea is, the more it pins carbon. Is that so? <laughs> I'll give a give a typical scientific answer. Uh, yes, uh, yes, and no, and it depends. <laughs> so, so yeah, this uh, this is an, a, a linkage that's that's of course really really interesting, but it really really depends, of course, on the community and and the circumstances. But I'd say, um, okay, this is an opinion, not an analysis result, but I'd say on average in the waters where we are doing our research, I'd say that there is a positive correlation between the degree of eutrophication and the amount of carbon, at least the amount of carbon in the form of methane and carbon dioxide in the surface waters. This is also a little bit about how you define eutrophication, but if you define it strictly as the amount of organic matter, you could also translate that to carbon in the surface waters, then I think the overall effect would be, so to say, climate negative, <laughs> if you want to put it, put it that way. But I mean, yeah, in the middle of the summer when the conditions are right, I mean, these surface waters that are eutrophied, they are also binding a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, but then most, most of the year the, the situation would be the opposite. I'm looking at the studio. Is it okay if we go five minutes over time? <laughs> yes, because there are so excellent questions. Uh, this is actually to Tuomas Kimmo Airi, on, of everybody can answer. On erosion hotspots, would it be better to focus on buffer zones or to enhance soil structure and soil health? Uh, the, the problem with buffer zones, especially if they are at the field edge, is that the once the soil has kind of gotten loose, the, the aggregates have been destroyed and there's water coming through and water is accumulating in force and collecting more material. It's unrealistic to expect that a 15 meter wide buffer would stop that. So I instead the, the buffer and the erosion control should be at the spot where the kind of force of the water is enough to start pulling soil particles off. That's that's also where the kind of nutrients give the most benefit for the farmer. If if we collect mm. all the nutrients and the carbon to the field edge at a buffer, mm. it's that's like what's point. the point? It's better to keep mm. it where it is. Ari, do you want to comment on this? Um, that is true. It's better to keep nutrients there where we can really utilize them. And uh, as I mentioned also that uh, those buffer zones, we need to collect uh, plant material away from these areas and we don't know what to do with them in areas we don't where we don't have animals but there is many kind of problems uh, connected to them but of course we have also good results scientific results that they can also help to uh, reduce the risk of reaching Thank you. Clear answer. And then there are many questions. I think we, I'm looking now for Yari Liski again, because a lot of questions about the stability of the carbon and about the carbon markets. That, of course, is a hot topic. So maybe start with this question. What is the future of carbon markets, Yari? Uh, and the others can ask also. Of <laughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, the, uh, I think that nobody knows exactly uh, exactly what, what what it will be like but there's a, like a very rapidly growing interest towards different kind of carbon carbon uh, market uh, options and mechanisms and here in Finland the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry just a, a month or two ago published a kind of a first kind of a report of the of this of the status of these developing carbon markets here and there the kind of the there was like an outlook on the current situation, and they also identified that which are the kind of the the the, the things that slow down the development in the carbon marketing mechanisms. And the, the one of the key things for this that's a reliable verification methodologies, mm -hmm. and which are sort of uh, 
practical enough for reliable uh, quantification of this carbon, uh, the, of the carbon sequestration that was seen as one of the kind of the things that slow down the development. And then if you if you look at internationally, internationally, maybe I would say that from this Finnish perspective, why my feeling is that the international the interest is even higher than it is currently here in mm -hmm. Finland. So there are many companies either in the food sector or outside the food sector, which are very interested in these uh, in these compensation mechanisms and companies in food sector. They also when they have these uh, climate roadmaps for their companies, they have included the kind of option that if if uh, the farmers are using regenerative farming practices and are and they can you know show the impacts of that, they get a higher price for the raw materials that they produce. These kind of mechanisms. So it's uh, I would say that the future is that it, it's uh, in one way or another, mm. it, it will grow very rapidly to the kind of measures that we have hard time imagining right now. It's difficult to imagine that kind of a future, but that will be a major change in the society and it will be surprising to many for how many actors will actually be mm. involved in this verifying, uh, mm. marketing, producing and then uh, kind of making sure that everything has been calculated correctly and stuff like that. Maybe Thomas has an idea from, uh, the, from a farmer's perspective mm. on this. Well, well yeah, yeah or, or I would just want to add it that the kind of there's the, also the biggest buyer, which is the European Union, which is reforming the cap mm. right now and is planning to target 40 percent of the payments to climate mitigation. So like if that goes mm. well and it actually gets targeted to increased carbon sequestration and climate gas mitigation, that's a huge kind of payment for farmers to implement these. And if it doesn't go well, then then we need these other markets to kind mm. of guide agriculture to that direction. Yeah, that was very, very, and I have to agree, like seeing with this carbon action work now, it's very, of course, a positive problem that we get a lot of contact from from different companies, from international collaboration, that, that really there is a lot of happening. And, and, and as Yari says, it's going to be the future. But of course, the top quality science, as Yari is now doing in carbon action, that is what is needed. I think I take the final question. This is a really good question. I guess everybody has something to say about it. So what are the best ways to get persistent, stable carbon into the agricultural soils? We were talking about the tillage earlier, but we have uh, some, con but, but what, what are the best ways? Uh, it, I think in the Finnish context for a lot of soils, we increase photosynthesis time. Mm. So, so we have a lot of spring cereals, we have low use of cover crops. We could double the amount of green time. So that would be one of the best ways, cover crops. Great. That was nice and simple answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, uh, anybody else? wants to continue? No. Yeah, uh, but I, I would just yeah. like it, you know, yeah. convert that without the photosynthesis, it's there's no other way of getting to carbon into the into the yeah. soil. So that's maybe the primary thing. Then another thing is that if you get it there, how how to keep it there? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so it's easy and then to have the phosphorus also to stay there that yeah. was sort of the topic of today and so we have to have the solar panels on today it's a bit snowing but but mm. it will come mm. we have longer days does i want to comment on this uh, and yeah. just to say that when you really know that the best method please tell it to us farmers also and i have to now maybe advertise in in, in carbon action we have now opened this e-learning platform for for regenerative farming. It's now first in Finnish and in Swedish. But, but uh, we can put, for example, a link there. And this is a very effective way, of course, to to, to take this research mm. to the practice. Mm. That is really, of course, critically needed. But now I think we have gone five minutes over time, but it has been really excellent uh, presentations. And thank you so much for our very active audience, for all the really interesting and good questions. I really was happy to see that it was such an interactive webinar. So thank you for everybody, for the audience, for, for all the presentations. And, and we will make a summary of this webinar and we will put the recording also to the web page. We will send it to you, everybody by, by an email, by a link, but it's also going to be open to everybody on the web page of this webinar. But thank you once again. And uh, we'll continue with this carbon action scientific work. Thank you.